three major periods, and, and unfortunately when you read books, uh, they claim there are three major periods, but you really have to understand there's a lot of overlapping, a lot of the blanks are still being made today, but they classified it in terms of what was happening in the time, and so they have what's called the classical period, the transitional period, and the rug period. Those are the three biggest periods of blankets, and they divide them under that, but you have to, I want you to understand, they still make classical blankets today, they still make uh, the same blankets that were made in the transitional period, but what they're talking about was the way Indians worked, the way they thought at the time period, and so that's why I divided these blankets up, and you'll see here, we're going to start with the classical period and work our way down to the rug period, and so we'll cover all three, and we'll do kind of a quick historical uh, program based on on the way the Indians did their blankets, why they did it. You see, when I started collecting, I I started collecting initially arrowheads, and then as I got more interested, I started collecting Indian blankets, and I started with not any idea or concept of of why a blank was made. I just did it because, it, you know, how many times we buy things because it's pretty, <laughs> you know. And so my dad told me, he said, you know, Gary, if you start reading about the history of these Indians, you might learn something, you know, you might learn how to make better decisions because he always said one of the main things you can learn in life is that if you study history, it'll help you make better decisions because history repeats itself. I. You know, we think our father's fools, so wise we grow, some doubt our wiser sons will think us so. so. I never understood that, okay, when I was young. But as I got older and got a little wiser, I began to realize what he was saying. And what I have learned is that every single one of these blankets has a story to tell. There's something to tell you about it. And that's what makes them so beautiful. It's the story behind the blanket itself. Well, we'll get back. We started with the idea that every blanket has a story, and I, I, I love these stories of these blankets. And the first blanket we see here is a Spanish blanket. It's not Navajo. And there's a lot of reasons we know that. Uh, what the Spaniards did, and of course this blanket is not a 1600, 1700 blanket, because those are in museums and they only have little pieces of them. <laughs> so, uh, but the, the reason I put this one up is, Spanish came to the Rio Grande area in the early, uh, late 1500s, early 1600s, and they brought with them the important things to make a blanket. They brought the merino wool sheep. That sheep was uh, grown for just its wool. It is the softest wool. You can make beautiful blankets out of it. They also brought the loom. All of these things weren't available to the, to the Native American at that time. And because they brought the loom and the wool, then they came to America, and what they did was, which was a little, uh, uh, was to explore, to search for the city of gold, a lot of people think. It was also to colonize. So when the Spaniards came, they were kind of like an army on the move. Now, if you're an army on the move, you've got to have two things. you got to have food, and you have to have somebody making clothes for you, materials so that you could keep your keep on exploring to do that when they entered the Rio Grande area there were three Indian tribes there was the Hopi the Pueblos and the Navajos now the Hopi and Pueblo were farmers they had cities somebody was talking about that they had cities it was easy for the Spaniards to go into a city and enslave those people to give them food and make their clothes for them but the Navajos were different. The Navajos did not, were not farmers. They were hunters. So they went with the herds. They were kind of nomadic. So when the Spaniards met the Navajos, they were there today and gone tomorrow. So they couldn't depend on them to make blankets. They couldn't depend on them or force them. And so what happened was the Navajos had three basic skills, very unique. One was hunting, obviously. They were excellent at hunting. The other one was borrowing. Now, we call it borrowing. Today, we'd probably call it stealing. <laughs> they literally would come across maybe uh, a Pueblo Indian or Hopi Indians, a group of them. They'd overpower them. They would take their things. 
they would go down several miles later, find some more Hopi Indians, and trade the Hopi Indians things that they just stole. <laughs> so the Hopis didn't really like the Navajos. They kind of lived uh, uh, with them, but they were kind of their enemies. And they, they often didn't trust them because they didn't know whether they were there to trade or if they were there to, to hurt them. So there was this strong uh, argument, uh, disagreement of the two, but that's how the Navajos lived. They lived off of hunting, but the other skill that they developed so well was bartering. One thing you want to learn is never negotiate with a Navajo. They'll always win. Their whole culture was built on bartering. <laughs> so when you go back, understand that very early on, they were already learning how to barter and trade, and that was one of their biggest ways that they were making li uh, living. So when the Spanish came, they enslaved basically the Hopi Indians and the Pueblo Indians because they could control them. And they brought them the loom, they brought them the wool, they brought them the sheep, and they brought them the knowledge. And you can tell a Spanish rug. This is an 1890s Spanish rug. First place, the Spanish loom was horizontal, like this. So when you made a rug, you could only make half of it. Once you made half, you take that off the loom, you'd make the other half. And then you'd sew the two parts together. The other thing that tells you this is a Spanish rug is the center diamond. The, the center diamond was, throughout Spaniards' history, they always had, they loved the diamond. And the serrated diamond is found on a lot of Spanish blankets. And you'll always find them in the center. Believe it or not, as we go down the line, you'll begin to see how that influenced the Indians and make, uh, Native Americans in making their blankets because they were heavily influenced by the Spanish because that's where they had learned how to make blankets. And that's why this blanket is so interesting because it is an 1890s blanket. It has that beautiful center diamond that they have, the beautiful colors, the excellent wool. It's a very soft wool, very excellent wearing blanket, but it had the center. Now, you have to understand the first people that really started learning, a lot of people think it was the Navajos, it wasn't. The ones that learned from the Spaniards were the ones that they enslaved. It was the Hopis and Pueblos that were making blankets. Because the culture is different, their farming meant that the men would go out and do the farming, gather crops, bring it back, and it was the women that had to prepare the meals, put them in storage, make the pots and everything else. They were really busy. So the male Hopi Indian had time and it was a male Hopi Indian that learned how to make blankets for the Spaniards. And they were the ones that started the design. And what you see here, this blanket dates back, in fact, it has a tag on it, it tells you uh, in 1937 when this blanket was at a trading post and it has a label on it, uh, it was 90 years old. So this dates back into the 1880s. It is a Hopi blanket and you can see the lines. We know pretty much that uh, the older blankets basically had this, this straight line in them, the very early blankets that they made. And they were pretty much uh, beige, brown, black, basic colors, because they had to use natural materials to make their blankets. They had some reds they could create, but not real strong reds because everything was natural. They, they had nothing to, to work with but nature itself. Now what happened, and the reason I have the Hopi blanket here is, in 1680, the Hopis had a revolution and they threw the Spaniards out of their village. But you know, we always learn lessons about life. And, and one of the things was, in America here, we have a lot of freedom. We don't know how valuable that freedom is but we get to see it and we get to use it every day. How valuable is freedom to, to a human being?